We've worked on a new demo with Big Dev for the official demos in Godot 3. As you requested it, here is grid-based motion. And it's trying to show some good practices when you are creating a grid-based system so that the grid and collisions and what's placed on the grid is separate from the characters and their motion. So that when press an arrow key, the actor script, the actor node that we can see here, the, the little arrow, it will request for the grid to move. And it's the grid that says, no, there's an obstacle in front of you or there's an AI that moved to that cell, so you can't move there. Then the actor itself, the actor scene, is all about how the character moves and it only manages the animation. So let's look at that. We're going to start with the pawn class. In my scene, I have an obstacle and an object. Right now, they are not represented on the screen, but these use a simple script called pawn.gd. And the actor, the character that moves, inherits from that pawn.gd script. Very simple one. It has only a type value that you can set through the inspector. So there are three types, actor, obstacle, object and you could extend that. The types are hard-coded in the pawn script because that's the only way to export an enum from a script. All the objects that live inside the level are the children of a grid object that's going to manage them. You can see the grid has some tiles to represent what's in what cell, and uh, we will look at the grid script after that but you just have to know that the grid uses that type value to know what's in a given cell. Now on the actor, if we look at the script, it's all about motion, as I explained. At the start, we update the look direction on the character, and in the process function, we listen to the player's input, and if there's some input, we update the look direction again. So you have two functions for that. They are pretty simple. Then it's going to ask the grid, the grid object, so it's parent. It's going to use the request move function on the grid, pass it itself and the input direction to say, can I move in that direction? The grid answers, it either returns a target position that the character will move to or the character will bump against an obstacle. So if I play the scene again and I move the character against an obstacle, you can see uh, it cannot move. So it gives you that little animation. Same thing if you bump against an object or another actor, for example. Okay, let's look at the move to function, the one that makes the character move. So here's how it works. First, we set process to false because we use the process function to listen to the player's input. Then we play the walk animation. We just fire it, we start it, because in the tween statement below, we use the current animation length. So we need to set the animation before we launch the tween. So the animation, if I go back to the actor scene, is going to make the character jump visually and there's a modulate track to add a little bit of contrast to it. It only does that. The character jumps in place and then we're going to use the tween node to move the character on the screen but we cannot know in advance in which direction it's going to move so we uh, use tween because we're going to calculate the animation values, the start and end positions on the fly. So first we calculate the character's move direction. It's the difference between the target position and the current position, the starting position, that we normalize. So it's using the normalized method on the vector2 class here. Then we interpolate the position, but not of the actor, we interpolate the position of the pivot node, which is here for animation. We are going to set the character to the target position instantly. In parallel, we animate the pivot, its child, starting back from the starting position to the final position. So as this swap happens instantly, let me show you what happens. You get this. When you move on the grid, say you move to the right, the character moves instantly like that, and we move back the pivot, and then the tween node is going to animate it smoothly 
going to the target position. We do that so that the actor can reserve the cell it's moving to instantly. So we use the interpolate property method on the tween to do that. We start at minus the move direction. So we move the pivot back, the size of the cell, in the direction opposite to the direction you're moving to, and we animate back to a, a position of zero, zero. So it moves back to the parent actor node 2D. For the duration, we use the animation's length. So it's going to tween for the same duration as the walk animation, meaning if you make the walk animation longer, the tween is also going to be longer. And then the tween type is not important. We use a linear tween, so the easing has no influence on the motion. But you could play with that if you wanted to make the motion a little bit choppier or give it some more contrast. On top of using the tween, I instantly set the sprite's position to make sure that everything animates properly. Now, this line is a mistake. Let's remove it. It won't be in the final script. So we set the position of the character instantly. We start the tween. And finally, this is the most important part. We use yield to turn this function into a coroutine. So right there, it's not going to run the set process to true. So once you yield, the function stops its execution. It stores the state of the function, the variables you have here, etc. even though we don't use that in that case. And you can pass in an object and a signal to resume the execution of the function. So in this case, it's going to wait until the animation finish signal is emitted from the animation player. And once it does, it's going to resume the execution and go down to set process back to true. So when the animation is finished, when the character is finished walking, we start listening to the player's input again. Then the bump function works in a similar way. So we set process to false. We don't listen to input. We play the bump animation this time. We yield in the exact same way. And once the bump animation is done, we set process back to true. This is a way to make it a little simpler to have everything in line instead of using a callback method once a signal is emitted. This makes it so we don't have to connect the animation finish signal to the actor and add some extra function and run some checks there. We have everything in one function in line. That's why we are using yield. The next piece of the puzzle to look at is the grid. So let me open the grid script by clicking on the script next to the grid node. This one builds upon the tile map node. Tile map has a few properties, but also methods to help us work with a grid. First, we find the same enum that we have on the pawn, the cell types. You have to copy it between one script and the other. I've tried to use auto loads, but the problem is that when I select an object or an actor, it's a pawn and I can set its type through the inspector. But the only way to get that drop down list this way is to have the enum inside of the script. If you try to put it in a separate auto load script, so a globally available script or object, it will not work. Godot will throw an error. So that's why I'm duplicating this line between the pawn and the grid script so that they have the same reference to the cell types. It's something that shouldn't move too much, so it's not too big of a deal. Both the pawn and the grid use the same types as reference. At the start of the game, the grid is going to loop over its children and it's going to update the tile map using the set cell v method. Set cell v means set the cell, so modify the cell on the tile set using a vector 2 as a position. That's what the v stands for, and that's the first argument in the function. We use world to map to convert a position in pixels, a vector 2 position, the child's position in the world, to a position on the grid. And then we pass in the child's type, and this is the index of the tile you're going to apply to the map. So if I go back to my map, this is the same thing as doing this, placing an actor under the character. And when the character moves, for example, if it moves down, 
the grid will update the actor's position. It will remove the first cell and it will add the actor on the cell where the character is moving. So it's going to loop over this actor, the second one and the object that currently you can't visualize on the map but I can duplicate them, move them anywhere. I'm going to use snapping to make sure I snap two cells. And if I play the game, you will see two objects and two actors. There you go. So that's what the ready function does. And because we're using the tile map node, we don't have to create a new function. We can use what's built inside. Then you have a function to get a pawn from a cell. For example, I want to know what's on this cell where we have actor two here. So when the character is moving, if it's going to bump into it, for example, if it bumps in an object, you may want it to pick up the item. So for that, you need to know if it's bumping into an object, if it's bumping into a monster and it's going to take damage, etc. So you would use that function to know more about what's in the cell because the objects that are on the grid are still regular nodes that can move in any way, and there's no direct connection between the grid and the actors. So every time you do that, it's going to loop over the nodes, check that the node has the same type you are requesting, and then it's going to use the world to map function again to get the position of the node, each of the nodes in the list, in grid coordinates and if it matches the cell you are looking for it's going to return the node saying that's the content of that cell. So this way we don't have to manage an array on the grid. You can see it doesn't have any member variable and this will work for different sizes of games. It doesn't matter if you have a few dozens of objects here it will run fast okay. Even if it seems a bit bizarre you don't have to optimize if this runs fast enough. And the last function is request move. It's the one that the pawn or the actor can use to ask if it can move to a new cell. So first we calculate the cell the character is starting from using the world to map function again. And then we calculate its target cell. It is the starting cell plus the direction. Remember that direction is always a vector two with a value of zero, one or minus one on the x-axis and same thing on the y-axis. So you can move horizontally, vertically or diagonally. Then it's going to take the tile ID of the target. Maybe I can clarify that a little bit and check what's inside of the cell. So it uses the get cell v method to get the ID of the tile on the grid. So we're not working with the children here, we're working directly with the grid. Say for example, we have an object right below the character, it's checking for this tile ID inside of the grid tile map and it ignores the nodes at this point. If the tile ID is minus one, it means that the cell is free. This ID of minus one is the ID of all the tiles in a tile set that are empty, right? And the other tiles, actor, object, obstacle, respectively have IDs of zero, one, and two. And it goes up as you add more tiles. But minus one means the cell is free, which means the actor can move. So we set the new cell, we move the actor, Actually, I should use pawn.type here. So we assign the actor or anything that would move. Maybe we could have a monster type later and assign it to the new cell. And then we set the starting cell free because the character has moved. And we return the position of the new cell saying, okay, now you can move to that new cell. So before we use the world to map function, now we use map to world. This is the complementary function that takes a position on the grid and that converts it to a position in pixels on the screen or in the game world. So we get that and we add half the cell size so that we get the center of the cell because this function returns the top left corner of a grid cell. Now, if we are in front of an object or an actor, let me show you if we have some object, for example, the character wants to move down, it cannot. Instead, we're going to print some information. We don't return a position. The function is going to return null at the end. So the character knows that it can't move. We just print that cells, something contains just some info to show you that we are getting information about what's in the cell. 
If I move down on the actor, I'll have to show the output console. And if I try to bump into the actor, you will see in my console, the cell 77 contains actor two. That's the second actor in my tree. And if I go to the object, we're going to see cell 84 contains the object and cell 123 contains object two. So there you go. That's the basics of decoupled grid-based movement. This makes your grid system scalable if you separate the characters and the grid very well. So that's one implementation. Keep that in mind. But in general, you want the grid to be responsible for managing the game board, if you want, managing the grid, the cells, the content of the cells, some info about what's on the board, but not too much. And the actors will be responsible for moving, maybe uh, throwing spells, attacking, things like these. The grid shouldn't have to bother about that. And then the game node that's currently empty could later manage the turns in a turn-based action game using the order of the nodes in the grid. So this way you also get uh, turn orders. To wrap this up, something I learned we can do and that I didn't know before uploading the code. In an enum, you can add entries where you set the value with the equal sign. The enum is going to generate values like 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. for each of the flags or identifiers you put inside of it. But you can add a custom identifier with a custom integer value. I haven't tried if you can use strings or something else, but at least you can use integers. So we can add an empty identifier with a value of minus one. This is the ID for empty cells in a tile map and replace the two places where we had a hard-coded minus one with the empty identifier. So it's a little clearer if when we move, the cell we want to move to is empty, we update the pawn's position. And same thing when we update the pawn's position, the starting cell where the pawn was, we make it empty. That's a simple but a pretty nice improvement to the code. That said, thank you kindly for watching. Enjoy the demo and enjoy the code. You can use it and build upon it. It's open source. It's in the official demos as well. Uh, I've also added the ability to pick up objects. You don't really pick them up, but they get destroyed when you walk over them. There's also a demo that shows how to use the A star pathfinding to have a character move on a grid where you click behind cells. It will find the path on its own. This one is really complimentary. That's it. Be creative, have fun, and see you in the next one. Bye-bye.